mother of a pandas child, as Diana said. I'm also the co-leader of the Arizona Support Group, coordinator of support groups. So an aside, if you are thinking about starting a support group in your area or you are curious if there is one in your area, please come find me. It is my honor and privilege to introduce our next speaker to you. Dr. Melanie Alarcio is a pediatric neurologist with Phoenix Neurology and Sleep Medicine in Phoenix, Arizona. When I first met Dr. Alarcio, we had an appointment at her clinic. We had already been through three years of misdiagnoses and then with a proper diagnosis with Dr. K, two IVIGs, antibiotics, and on and on. After the examination, I looked at Dr. Alarcio and I asked her, do you think you can help my son? And she looked me in the eye and she said, Carrie, I'm a doctor, but I'm a mommy first. And boy, was she right. Dr. Alarcio calls her patients her kids, and she really thinks of each child as her own child in how she treats. She is brilliant, she listens, she is caring, and she is a problem solver. She never gives up on our kids. She knows that I affectionately refer to her as Saint Melanie. <laughs> so would you please help me welcome Dr. Melanie Alarcio to our conference. <laughs> Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Pandas Network, for giving me the opportunity to share what I know and how I treat. I'm a clinician, so my talk will start with cases, but um, what I try to do is to review the interrelationship of the brain, the immune system, behavior, and maybe gain a better understanding of what I call psychoimmunoneurology, only because most of our children present with psychiatric or behavior symptoms. The immune system is involved, and it does have something to do with the brain. And also to continue advancing awareness of autoimmune encephalopathies, because I believe that if you diagnose them early and start the immunomodulatory treatments early, you'd be successful. I had a child I saw at the emergency room within three days. And when we started the high-dose steroids, she totally recovered. I haven't even had a remission. Compare those to the other children that I see after they've seen 30 doctors and their chart when they come in is that thick. I have a harder time getting them back. In February, I was invited to talk at the Hashimoto's Encephalitis Faces Conference. And they... Um, I, it allowed me to read the book, Understanding Hashimoto's Encephalitis. And in the foreword, I was struck by these statements. Because you can substitute HE in all these statements with PANDAS, with PANS, and all the other um, autoimmune encephalitis. It is not well understood. Patients often face an enormous struggle trying to find the correct diagnosis. Many neurologists, my colleagues included, have never even heard of the condition, or they will even say it doesn't exist. Misdiagnosis is the rule more often than the exception, and patients and their families almost universally find themselves having to do their own research in order to try and figure out what to expect, what their treatment options are, and how best to cope. And this is seen in the survey that was presented earlier. Let me start with the cases. Case one is a 12-year-old left-handed male. He was in good health until November 2008 when he presented with fever and a rash. He was tested by his pediatrician and found to have Lyme infection. He did live in Lyme country. So he was treated, he recovered. But in November 2011, three years later, he received a flu shot with the H1N1 component. And within 24 hours, he had severe anxiety, inattention, hallucinations, delusions, and involuntary movements. A month later, he began to have seizures, but the EEG, even while he was having seizure, would just be very slow, which is not typical because um, as a neurologist, when you have an active seizure, you actually see the seizure activity in the EEG. Now, with the psychiatric symptoms, this family, the parents were accused, oh no, this is psychiatric. This is not related to Lyme, not related to not autoimmune. It was only after they saw 
a pediatrician and a pediatric neurologist who was a family friend and knew the boy before he got sick that they started getting treatment. The second case is a 16-year-old right-handed female who at the age of 10, this was before I met her, presented with seizures with an abnormal EEG and also had selective mutism and delusions. Because of the selective mutism and delusions, the seizures became secondary and she was diagnosed with schizophrenia. She was 10. She was placed on oxcarbazepine, Depakote, and haloperidol. Her symptoms apparently slowly resolved and by 2005 was off all medications. I met her in 2009 when she went to the emergency room because she had three seizures in a 24-hour period. The EEG again just showed slowing. Within a week, so she was in the hospital because she continued to have seizures. She developed severe anxiety, confusion, paranoia, hallucinations, and aggression. She was so aggressive, she had to be restrained, and when that wouldn't stop her, she was just injuring herself. She was actually transferred out of the medical unit into the psychiatric unit, where she stayed for like six weeks. Then I have a 14-year-old right-handed female who presented at the emergency room with acute onset lethargy and three generalized tonic-clonic seizures, each lasting about 10 minutes. The EEG again showed diffuse slowing. She also developed visual hallucinations. She said there were aliens in the room too. Language impairment and memory problems. Three days before this, she had low to moderate grade fever, muscle weakness, and a rash in her hands. An emergency, at the emergency room, her exam was normal, and we drew labs, including CSF and serum on, um, studies for infections. And the last case is 12-year-old right-handed male who, at the age of six, initially complained of a sore throat. Within six weeks, he had vocal and motor tics. Then in six months, in that period, it was developing severe coprolalia, OCD behaviors, and career form-like movements. He was seen outpatient by both a neurologist and a psychiatrist and diagnosed with Tourette disorder and severe OCD and started on psychotropic medications, which only made him worse. No labs or anything was ever done. So as a clinician, when you see cases like this, be it at the emergency room or at, in the clinic, the first thing, at least for me as a doctor, is that, okay, what could this be? So you go through differential diagnosis. What is the worst that could happen if I don't do anything? Could this kill the patient? So you go through that in your mind. So you have a differential diagnosis. Then you think, okay, what workup can I do? How can I help the family so that the workup I do is logical enough that the insurance is going to cover it? And what do I treat? Do I start treatment before waiting for the labs to come back? Is it that urgent? Do I send him to the hospital immediately? So those things go through your mind as you're meeting each of these patients. Now, you're going to hear the case. What's the most dangerous? Being a neurologist, it would be an encephalitis because it means your brain is actively inflamed. So you're going to hear encephalitis versus encephalopathy. What's the difference? NINDS, which is the National Institute for Neurologic Disorders and Stroke, define encephalitis as an irritation or inflammation of the brain, usually in an acute manner. Its clinical features, you usually typically have a prodrome, mild flu-like symptoms, headache, fever, so you have physical symptoms. And then you get the altered mental status, seizures, hallucinations, visual disturbances, and if the meninges are involved, you can have neck rigidity. Encephalopathy is defined as diffuse disease of the brain that alters brain function or structure. Hallmark is altered mental status. So if you go to the emergency room and you're confused, disoriented, they say, oh, okay, he's encephalopathic. Could this be an active infection or something else? There's progressive loss of memory, cognitive ability, personality changes, cannot concentrate. Then you can also have involuntary movements and seizures. Most causes of encephalitis typically infectious and the most dangerous for us neurologists is herpes simplex virus because you can get um, sequelae, um, especially in a developing child. Encephalopathy, you can also have infectious causes, but it can also be metabolic or mitochondrial trauma, stroke. But diagnosis, you arrive at the same way. You get a good history and a good exam, CSF analysis, imaging studies, an EEG, antibody and serology testing, and sometimes we do need a brain biopsy. Now, encephalitis 
per se can be classified as infectious and non-infectious, but I will be concentrating on the antibody and the um, autoimmune. So the immune system in the brain, is there a relationship? The immune system functions to protect us, host defense against infectious organisms, but it also preserves the uniqueness of self. So a fundamental aspect of the immune system is to recognize what cells belong to you, foreign molecules from self molecules. So this is your basic immune response. So when something invades you here, you stimulate the innate system, and you have your neutrophils, dendritic cells, macrophages, trying to get rid of that invading intruder. And they produce cytokines, which typically cause the inflammation. And as they do this, your adaptive immunity kicks in, which produces your B cells and T cells that produces your antibodies. That's your typical immune response. So again, this is another schema. There's your antigen, your defenses. So you've got the cell-mediated immunity as well as the antibody-mediated immunity. Another cartoon, so they recognize that it is invading. It activates the cells necessary to fight it. And then they try to get rid of the cells. And then they remember so that next time you meet it, you have a good fighting um, response. So for many years, the researchers believed that the brain was totally separated from the immune system. That's why it's very hard to convince others that there is such a thing as an autoimmune encephalopathy, because they said, no, the brain separate. And the reason for that is especially the existence of the blood-brain barrier. Now, this was discovered in the early 1900s because during autopsy, somebody injected a dye and they found that the brain didn't stain, and then when they injected another dye, the brain stained. So they realized, oh yeah, there's a barrier. So everybody thought that that was what it did. It just separated the brain from the rest of the body. So what does it look like? So taking a portion of that, this is your blood vessel inside your brain. Astrocyte, initially until about 20, 30 years ago, we thought the astrocyte was just a support cell, much like you know your fatty tissue, your subcutaneous tissue. It didn't do anything. That's changed. So this is your blood-brain barrier. So this is the blood, this is the brain. Typically, it's a single layer of cells, but there's a very tight junction. Now we're realizing that it just doesn't pr um, provide a barrier. There is actually a regulatory interface between the CNS and the peripheral tissue. Something happens to your blood-brain barrier. It can be modified and affected by circulating substances, not just from the blood side, but from the brain side. Now, the roles of the cells of the blood-brain barrier, it can serve as a barrier. That was what we thought it just did. But there's also a lipid permeable cell which allows small lipid soluble molecules to cross. And just as an aside, most psychotropic medications, this is how they get to the brain. There is also a transporter role and as a secretory cell. So now we know that it is not as tight, it is not as separate. There are ways for substances to get across that and get into the brain. So water-soluble agents very seldom get into the brain, but the endothelial cell has a very wide lipid membrane and it can allow lipid-soluble agents to cross. There's also receptors that you can use. So apart from the barrier function permeability, we now know that all of these normal functions of the brain can be altered in an adaptive or pathologic manner by neuroimmune events. So what this makes us realize is that the blood-brain barrier, it's not just a separation between the brain and the body. It's actually a conduit in the communication of the immune and central nervous system. And because it's communication, that means it's not one way, it's two ways, it goes back and forth. So one link is that T cells and dendritic cells, you remember the innate and adaptive um, immune response? It's actually neurotransmitter modulated. Dopamine and acetylcholine does that. All your lymphoid organs, which is the source of your B cells and T cells, actually are innervated by your sympathetic nervous system. And then you have the neuroendocrine outflow through the pituitary gland. So, you have the nervous system mediating functions of the immune system and the immune system 
regulating functions of the nervous system. And this was best studied by the studies on fever, hyperthermia, and stress. So you have a systemic insult. This activates your immune system. So you have cells which start producing pro-inflammatory cytokines, PAMPSs, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. They get into that blood vessel, the neurovascular unit inside your brain, and it starts acting on the endothelial cell. When that happens, it stimulates the production of enzymes that then produce prostaglandin E2, which acts on the paraventricular neuron in your hypothalamus, so you're in the brain now, which then first starts activating the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis to produce glucocorticoids, your body steroids, which are anti-inflammatory. But in the fever studies, we have found that if you already have the fever, if they check your blood, sometimes you don't have the cytokines yet. So where's that coming from? So th there's now research that shows that the vagus nerve is also involved. And so it directly sends a signal into the brain through afferents and acts on these neurons as well. So now you have peripheral cytokines which act on the brain venules to produce PGE2. And then CVOs are circ circumventricular organs. This is parts of your brain where the blood-brain barrier is leaky or weak. And so it now produces brain cytokines. So you have cytokines in your body, cytokines in your brain, all producing PGE2 or directly acting on brain targets by diffusing across the parenchyma. And so it acts further away from where the blood vessel is, and you can have the neuroendocrine activation, you can have the fever, and you can have the sickness behavior. What are those sickness behavior? You have the decrease of food and water intake, decrease in social interaction, cognitive impairment, and activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Now, in the hypothalamus, PGE2 acts can also act on the EP3 receptor in the brain, and this actually modulates the release of neurotransmitters. So what happens is that the prostaglandins actually affect neural circuitry. So you have pro-inflammatory cytokines in the brain. You, this affects neurotransmitter metabolism because it affects reuptake. You have decreased neurogenesis, increased glutamate excitotoxicity. Glutamate is a major excitatory neurotransmitter in your brain, so you even have too much activation of that. So now you have an altered microenvironment in your CNS with altered neural circuitry. So this altered microenvironment signals to your blood-brain barrier. So you have something going on on the brain side affecting your blood-brain barrier, but you also have neural circuitry, the way the brain signals each other, and it attacks like the anterior cingulate um, cortex, your basal ganglia, and your limbic system. And you will see later that this will explain all the symptoms your kids have. So we just talked about the cytokines. What about the antibodies? So antibody transfer can also be induced by endothelial cell activation. How? Lipopolysaccharide, for instance, this is found in gram-negative um, organisms, can attach to TLR4, a receptor in the endothelial cell membrane, activates the cell, and cause disruption in your tight junction. Cytokines do that. Even epinephrine, which is um, produced when your body is under stress, can do that and disrupt. So now you have a direct way for the antibody to cross. You can also have that without activating the endothelial cell. NMDA, for instance, the, um, the antibody can attack attached directly to the NMDA receptor and then passively goes across by a transporter protein. Some of ne your neurons have dendrites going through that and the antibody can go directly to that. So antibody transfer can be induced. And then antibodies in your brain can also be effluxed back to the circulation, especially where it's leaky in the CVOs. So you now have a way for antibodies and cytokines to cross into the brain. So it is not a barrier, you know, as much as we expected. It's not an electrical fence. The other portion of this is, what if there's something innately wrong with your immune system already? So you have an abnormal 
innate immunity, so you cannot, in, you cannot completely eliminate your pathogens. So you have a chronic latent infectious state, and then you have the latent underlying inflammatory process going on. So if you have this already, it affects your blood-brain barrier, so things can go into your brain. Adaptive immunity, you lose immunotolerance, so you have that proneness to autoimmunity. This runs in families. So you have autoreactive autoantibodies or brain-reactive antibodies. So if your blood-brain barrier was intact, maybe these brain-reactive antibodies wouldn't produce any pathologic symptoms. But because of this, because of the cytokines, you now have a disrupted blood-brain barrier. So your brain-reactive antibodies can actually cross, and now you have modulation of neurologic and behavior symptoms. So now we have an idea of why we have those symptoms. So it has something to do with your, our immune system. So it's not just because it's strep, because it gives us an idea of how anything that stimulates our immune response can affect the brain. Now, autoimmune neurologic disorders can target virtually any structure within the central and peripheral nervous system. Sometimes when the cell type targeted occurs in many different CNS structures, then the syndromes, the presenting clinical symptoms would be wide. Immune-mediated or autoimmune encephalopathy comprise a large number of syndromes, some of which have only been recently identified. It is controversial because clinical presentation often includes recent onset of progressive cognitive and behavior problems, including inattention, hyperactivity, delusions, paranoia, and hallucinations. How many of us have heard, oh, my child's four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, he's starting school, he has ADHD, and then they stop there? Or there's a strong family history of um, bipolar, so that's probably what your child has. How many of our parents have heard that? It often mimics psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia and bipolar, but you know what? I still get upset when a four-year-old gets diagnosed with schizophrenia. It's like, really? It's challenging to evaluate because providers have low index of suspicion. They just don't think of it. A child, four-year-old, five-year-old, ADHD, send him to the psychiatrist or the therapist. Now, why are we impaired? Parts of your brain, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, this tells you, like this was especially in stroke, the thing with neurology is we're always asked, where is the lesion? You have this, what part of the brain? Frontal lobe, here, see? Loss, if you've got stroke, you can be paralyzed. Inability to plan a sequence of complex movements needed to complete multi-stepped tasks, such as making coffee. Things your child typically does, they forget. Loss of flexibility in thinking, this is the frontal lobe. Mood changes. Inability to focus on a task. Look at the parietal lobe. Remember the child who draws only on the left side or only on the right side? Inability to attend more than one object at a time. Inabil difficulty with math, difficulty with reading. Occipital lobe, color vision changes. Temporal lobe, difficulty recognizing faces. So you can actually see which part of the brain is affected depending on the symptom that your child presents with. I mentioned the anterior cingulate cortex. And you will see later how closely related it is. This is your anterior cingulate gyrus. So orientus of this is the front, this is the back. So this is your frontal lobe. And all those parts of the brain have something to do with emotion, regulation, both autonomic and voluntary. The basal ganglia, it has a complex role in control of voluntary movement and muscular tone, but it also helps the limbic system. It is not isolated. It helps the limbic system regulate behavior. It also helps in cognitive processes, memory, attention, planning. So this is your basal ganglia of the globus pallidus putamen caudate. The limbic system, the amygdala, for instance, rage, anger, same thing with the parahippocampal gyrus, rage and fright. Aren't, isn't this familiar to most of the parents with pandas, pants or autoimmune kids? Look at how they are all interrelated, how close they are to each other in the brain. 
And in the middle of this, you have the third ventricle, which has your CSF, which has your choroid plexus, where the blood-brain barrier is leaky. So you can see how easy it is for the antibodies and the cytokines to diffuse across the brain parenchyma and attack all of that. What about neurotransmitters? These are the important neurotransmitters. See the roles they play. Memory formation, sensory response, mood regulation, cognition, voluntary motion. Down here, memory, serotonin, sleep cycle. Oh, and by the way, there's a study at AAN right now saying that narcolepsy, a sleep disorder, is autoimmune in nature. And when I told that to one of my sleep neurologists, he looks at me and says, really? Because he was one of those who thought I was a quack. So. But dopamine, focus, attention, memory, motivation, mood, addictive disorders, norepinephrine, energy, drive, anxiety. These are all mediators of the things, the symptoms that we have. Histamine. Histamine is another thing that's important because like in the brain, it's a neurotransmitter that regulates sleep, hormonal secretion, memory formation, brain arousal. Let's see. Dopamine, serotonin. Clinical side, remember the cases? Vimpat on fin depakote for seizures. It didn't work. Um, autoimmune encephalopathy was his diagnosis. They did serum NMDA receptor antibody that was negative, but CSF was not done. He started IVIG in January 2012 with very good response. He has been seizure-free since May 2012, but continues to need IVIG every three weeks, and he still has relapses. Case two, we found her to be positive serum NMDA receptor antibody. Um, but she also had elevated DNA B and had a positive um, strep culture. So she was given penicillin, IVIG, plasmapheresis, IV solumedrol. Nothing worked. And the only sustained response we had was when we started her on cyclophosphamide. Um, their family has since moved to Mexico. But last I heard, she was doing well with only cognitive problems left. Case three, the seizures did not respond at all, but she had, this was the one that we saw the emergency room, her TPO antibody and antithyroglobulin antibodies were elevated. We gave her IV solumedrol one gram per day for three days, then maintained her on 60 milligrams oral prednisone daily, um, high dose, but she had impressive clinical improvement and has not had a relapse, but we got her within a week. Case four was found to have elevated antibody titers to strep and mycoplasma, had received IVIG and antibiotics, had been steadily improving, but has been having some flares. Um, mom describes that after having lost her child cognitively, physically, and emotionally, she now has him back. So let me just, this is um, one slide that I really want to share. Um, I actually created this as I was preparing for the talk because across the board, this is Hashimoto's, NMDA, PANDAS, and limbic or paraneoplastic. Look at the similarity in cognitive impairment, psychiatric symptoms. Some we have antibodies identified, but they are all responsive to immunomodulatory therapy. Oh, somebody asked about males um, here. Gender ratio, 2.6 to 1 in pandas. In less than 8-year-old, um, ratio is 5 to 1. This is from Dr. Suido. Symptom presentation, always acute or subacute. There's a variability in type of symptoms displayed by individuals, and symptom profiles may evolve over time, with one set predominant at one stage and others becoming problematic. So it changes, which makes it difficult for providers, and that's why most children are labeled behavioral. Now, when I first started this road, we started with Sydenham's, and then pandas, and then other organisms, and then non-infectious triggers, so I figured this can all fall under the umbrella of autoimmune or immune-mediated encephalopathy. But something else, see, immune-mediated. But see, I'm now realizing, because I have 20-year-old and 21-year-olds and 24-year-olds in my clinic, although I'm a pediatric neurologist, could this all fall under a bigger one, psychoimmunoneurologic syndromes? We have not fully understood the pathogenesis, the pathophysiology. We only know that because the psychiatric and behavior symptoms are so intense, we already saw how the brain is affected while you have those symptoms. We know the immune system is involved, but which one? 
And we know it's the brain. That's why I don't understand the division between psychiatry and neurologists. It's like the same brain. <laughs> don't we? I mean, I don't have a brain that just says psychiatric and another brain that says neurologic. It's not, which is why they don't like me. Co <laughs> cognitive bias. You know how we, it's, this is medical, so it can't be psychiatric or the other way around. This is purely behavioral. Why is it that the child is sent to the psychiatrist immediately? I don't understand that either. Because when I went to school, that was a long time ago, we were always taught that before you say something is a mental disorder, you make sure you cleared all the medical. How many of you got sent to the psychiatrist without even a blood test? Right? I had a patient who had catatonia. They all said, no, this is schizophrenia. I got rid of the catatonia after a dose of steroids and antibiotics. It was pandas. Young female, positive family history, oh yeah, this is psychiatric. Their family is crazy. How many of you have heard that? Or the disease does not exist. So I'll just go through, you do not have to wait for a neurology consult. Because a lot of the neurology, especially the older gentleman type with the bow tie, neurology type, some of you know that, they say it does not exist, right? But even the primary care provider can start with some labs. I mean, like getting an MRI, getting an LP, you probably need a neurologist for that. This just came from Eurodiagnostica. The other thing that I want here is that please do not hesitate. If your doctor says, you know what, let's do an LP, it's like we do it safely now. We don't torture your child anymore. We can sedate them. And that's the other thing. A lot of parents are, you know, a little concerned about the sedation, a little concerned about the LP, which is understandable, but um, talk to your doctor. It's like keep an open mind. So index of suspicion, providers should have a low threshold, especially if it's acute. It happens within days. Um, autoimmune encephalopathy is very responsive to immunotherapy if given early in the course. And then it's a multi-component management approach. Not just behavior, not just medication, but you have to accommodate academics as well. The cornerstone of treatment is immunomodulatory therapy, so talk to your doctors about steroids, IV, IG, plasmapheresis. And for some who are not responsive, we need to go to the other um, immune drugs. And for here, just so you know, as you go further down, you have more side effects. So a lot of neurologists, or even you know, doctors are a little wary of recommending this. But like I said, I had a patient who only responded to cyclophosphamide, and I have one now who I have to give rituximab. And I'm scared too. Okay, this is the problem. No practice guidelines for physicians. Highly individualized to patient. We try to initiate treatment, at least I do, as soon as possible. Not always possible. Recovery occurs over months, not days. Remissions and recurrence of symptoms is possible. And if there's no improvement with first line, which is usually steroids, then we go to the second line of treatment. Antibiotics, I just wanted you to know or be aware that there is a non-antimicrobial role of antibiotics. It can change inflammatory cell metabolism by altering cytokines, especially interferon, and it also offers neuroprotection. Ibuprofen, I just want to say that apart from that anti-inflammatory effect, it, is, it inhibits ICOM-1, which promotes neurodegeneration. So just some final thoughts, a little bit of perspective. Edward Jenner, who did the smallpox studies in England, he's, he noticed that dairy maids had cow, that had cowpox um, were protected against epidemic smallpox. So he introduced the procedure of inoculating subjects with infectious cowpox material. This was preceded by over 100 years by the work of Louis Pasteur. But when he reported this to the Royal Society of Physicians in England, he was, it was said to be incomplete, unconvincing, so much at variance with established knowledge and with also incredible. But 200 years later, WHO vaccination program has eradicated smallpox. How long ago since we started pandas, pandas, 20 years, we're early. It's a struggle for parents, but it's early. For physicians, listen to patients, listen to parents. But there's a need to establish a clinical standards of care. So this is from Dr. Murphy, because I think it's important. Let's chart a way forward. Let's stop the debate, because 
it's like, I don't have time for you, I'd rather treat my patients. Special thanks to these people who started me on this path. Dr. Anderson is my new partner who believes in what I do so that he's an adult neurologist, but sees how we can help the children. That's my family. And when I started this road, that was all I had. I met Susanna, and I've met the people at Hashimoto's, and I'm going to add more. Thank you. Yeah.